Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, second keynote. So let me ask you a personal question. Do you know that feeling when you're working with someone who is senior, who knows what they're doing, and who's got all the right answers? Okay, so whenever you're stuck, the right answer is right here next to you. Now imagine that wonderful feeling gone. This is what our next speaker, Dr. Chris Maroney, my friend and my mentor did to me after working together for about four years at CD Adapco. And I remember every day and every second of working with him. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Chris Maroney for his keynote. Does it work? Almost. Good afternoon, friends. After that introduction, I feel the best thing I can possibly do is to run out of that door and leave you to chat among yourselves for three quarters of an hour. But I've been asked to do this. And this morning at the first keynote, I have said, Chris will come and tell you how to do CFD. Now, you may not have noticed that there's a workshop going on around here. It's about this open foam code thing, which I believe does CFD exceedingly well, and you are all experts in it. You don't need me how to teach you to use CFD. But you might want me to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of reminiscencing, about how this came to be. Now, CFD goes back in many layers. My talk starts in 1988, but well before that, well before I joined Imperial College in 1985, we had Spalding Simple, Issa's Piso, we had finite volume, we had some co-located velocities, we had lots of things already in the mix. One of the things I'll be emphasizing, one of the things we didn't have was good software engineering. Fortunately, we were able to get inspiring speakers to lecture our CFD developers, as you can see on the slide, telling them how to do this. These guys are working on the speed code. You may have guessed that really they're not. Really they're from the late 19th century, but they were in Imperial. They were in black and white. Our CFD developers have just started on combustion. And we have been fortunate to recruit someone from their undergraduate degree in the chemical engineering department, a man called Henry Weller, of whom you may have heard. The man who a year later will go on to start writing foam. So to put things in context, this is not a whole CV of what I've done, but it's a CV of where I got to when I arrived at Imperial in 1985. So from this excellent university, I got a PhD in theoretical physics, which taught me how to use Fortran. Shame, but it did teach me how to use Fortran and some physics. I then worked for the Atomic Energy Authority. The Atomic Energy Authority got me to simulate Three Mile Island accidents and also taught me how to do large amounts of uh, CFD. The, mess the lesson I learned from that was, above all things, write your own code so you know what's in it. Because inevitably, anything you get given off the shelf is not going to do what you expect. And eventually I arrived at Imperial and I developed the speed code, which I talk about a bit more in a minute. In particular, I learned finite volume. And what I developed was a particular kind of unstructured finite volume. So speed 
coat of many names. It was sold to about three different sponsors under different names, but it was the same code. But as speed, it was a code for European car manufacturers, and it was based on previous imperial codes. So it was based on the strengths of previous imperial work. It was implicit. It was transient flow using piezo. But it was also limited in its mesh motion. Uh, it was for a um, internal combustion engine cylinder, and consequently it had cylinder axis grid motion. It was very one dimensional. And it was in Fortran 66. It had one major subroutine with many entry statements. It had go to's. It was not immediately obvious how it started one bit of the algorithm and how it finished the next. And so I began to work out what I might do. I added unstructured mesh. It wasn't completely unstructured. I'm not as good as Professor Yasak at getting buy-in from other people against their will. So I compromised on hexahedral mesh, so regular hexahedral connectivity, but unstructured within that. And since it was unstructured, I needed collocated velocities. And after Herb asked me to give this talk, I, I looked back at what I'd done and I realized how lucky I was because I had taken the most enormous leaps of this can't possibly go wrong. And there will be no problem with doing what I needed to do. I didn't have a linear solver. We eventually got to conjugate gradient by conjugate gradient. I didn't have a code for mesh generation. So we were using the existing structured meshes of the time. And I didn't have any way to visualize my solution or to do mesh motion on unstructured meshes. And to this day, I cannot remember how we got ourselves through that. The little picture on the side shows a small shell, small cell expanding to a big cell. And one of the first things I remember Gosman saying to me was, we have a problem with conservation of volume. And in the end, this was my picture. What you needed was for the sides of the cell to sweep out a volume, and that will then be your grid flux. And I couldn't see a method to do this with the existing structured meshes. So being optimistic or foolish, I wrote a code that would enable me to do this kind of unstructured mesh motion. I also wrote some structured Fortran. The pressure equation had its own subroutine. The velocity equation had its own subroutine and so on and so forth. It was not spaghetti code. It was wonderful. It was sufficient to inspire Henry Weller to see what the problem was because it had a structure there. And the problem with that structure was, although it encapsulated the equations, it was in Fortran. In order to go further, in order to become a toolbox that you could mix and match and put the equations together and take them apart and, and chain them one after the other, you needed a different language. You needed something that I knew nothing about. That something was obviously C++, but at the moment we had a black and white code. We needed a color code. One of the things that may have inhibited our success with speed was my sense of humor. All of the members of the speed team and indeed of the Imperial College contingent will testify that I have a, a sense of humor. 
I hope you can read that. If you can't, please put your hand up. And otherwise, please enjoy. So why didn't old black and white photos turn color too? Because they were color pictures of black and white. Remember, those of you who are not parents yet, remember, this is what you can do to regain the mastery. And those of you who are already parents, good luck, I've been there. So continuing, along the lines of all the things that I knew that were obvious and I wrote them down and sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't work. Here are three things that I got wrong and then got right again. You already know these answers, but here at the top is the Gauss theorem pressure gradient. And I wrote it as a linear interpolation of the home cell and the neighbor cell. Surface integral over the cell divided by the volume. It kept kicking. It kept producing solutions in which sometimes the absolute pressure would assert itself. And they said, you can't do this. You can't do your uh, general unstructured finite volume. You need something where uh, you need to have actual pressure differences only in your formulation. So I realized that the sum of the vector sum of the areas over the cell is zero. And I substituted into the top equation to get the bottom one. The bottom one now has only pressure differences in. The source of the error was the fact that in a finite um, accuracy, uh, double precision arithmetic, uh, the sum of the areas was not zero. So what you do is you find a method of subtracting out the error. This is standard in foam now. This will be no surprise to any of you. I don't know if the same will be said for the pressure work term. As has been belabored by Professor Yassak, I'm a physicist, which means I deal with fundamental things like energy and don't really understand these enthalpy concepts. So I wrote the pressure work term for the energy equation as P div U. And then I wrote it out once again as a linear interpolation between neighboring velocities on cell faces. And again, I got strange results. The solution to this turned out to be that you replace the linear interpolation of the face velocities by the flux that you get from the pressure solution, which is converged, which minimizes the error on the uh, pressure equation, on the continuity equation. And if you divide that flux by the density you used in the first place, you get a face velocity or a normal component of the face velocity. And this worked. And remembering this, I thought, why did it work? Because that, Flux is not perfectly converged. However accurate it is, there will still be some error. But it was sufficient to get rid of the problem with the spiking energies. So in retrospect, 
not only would I have counted my chickens and produced a lot of infrastructure before starting, I would also have been very careful to test my code before sending it out even to my colleagues. I was fortunate that my colleagues caught all this. The last thing I'm going to show you never made it to the light of day, but it may be of interest. This is Piso, as done in speed, and also, as far as I know, done in open foam. We take a predictor, which is implicit in the velocity. It has a source term S. It has a pressure gradient where I am abbreviating the operator to D, which operates on the previous time step, the last pressure. I can write a corrector. The nth corrector is the same equation, but now it's an explicit equation. The new velocity is on the left, the previous velocity is on the right, and the new pressure is also on the right. And just for completeness, when I want to use u0, the zeroth corrector on that, it is in fact the predictor pressure. I stick those equations into the pressure corrector, dv equals zero. I'm not going any further than um, incompressible flow here. And you then go around the piezo loop and you eventually reach convergence. You'll notice I didn't write it in corrector form. And I look at that now and I think, how much error is accumulating as I go around this cycle? Why didn't I write it in corrector form? Why didn't I make sure the errors didn't add one after the other after the other? But it didn't affect the answer. Unlike the previous two, it didn't affect the answer at all. So it's something we all happily live with. And I don't know the answer to that. If I'd asked the question in the first place, then I might have an answer for you. But in the process, I produced an odd result. And in order to do that, I will rewrite the corrector as a correction. So u star is velocity minus previous velocity. P star is pressure minus previous pressure. And now reading from the top, I will need, can I just confirm? We were told this morning that I should Take that back. I was told this morning that I should move the cursor so that it will be visible to the online audience. But I think possibly because I'm in the middle of a display, it's not happening. So I will talk you through the equations. At the top left is the piezo corrector written in terms of corrections. And because it's going to be more convenient, I divide through by the diagonal coefficient A, and my capital H turns into a lower H, and my capital D, the pressure operator, the, the gradient operator, turns into a small d. So that's my definition of small h and small d. I now turn to the top right. This is the final solution I want to get, that U capital N, the final converged velocity, and P capital N, the final converged pressure, will satisfy this equation with everything implicit. And I can divide those up, those solutions up, that U capital N is U cross plus UP, the predicted velocity. I substitute that in the velocity positions, that Pn is P cross plus PL, pressure corrector correction, plus the last time step pressure. And now taking away the velocity predictor and doing my division by A, I have U crossed 
equals h crossed minus dp cross. And now I do what I probably should have thought of earlier, which is to make u cross the subject of the formula. My son has just done A-level, so I'm very into telling people to make something the subject to the formula. And I get 1 minus h u cross equals minus dp cross. And I can then invert that. u cross is minus 1 minus h to the minus 1 dp cross. And now for the innovation, I can expand 1 minus h to the minus 1 in powers of h. What I'm trying to do is to derive piezo. In, P in Issa's paper, you will see quite clearly um, that he defines piezo and that he proves that it is uh, going to have the convergence properties appropriate to the time step. But he never actually defines it, at least not to my memory. And he never quite explains why the behavior at small delta t is appropriate where you're applying it to an implicit large time step equation. So this was my go at trying to understand how piezo worked. I wanted it for something which I failed in. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But now I've got my power expansion in terms of H. Top left, U cross is minus the power series in powers of H to the minus, uh, not to the minus one. Sorry, I have made a mistake. I've left a minus one in. I have uh, already dealt with the minus one. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's imagine that you can parameterize the size of H. Let's stick a lambda in front of each of those H's. So you've got one plus lambda H plus lambda squared H squared plus lambda cubed H cubed. And now let's say, what would it be like if I took P cross, the total correction to the pressure, and wrote it as a power series in lambda? P0 plus lambda P1 plus lambda squared P2 plus lambda squared P3. And now I take bottom left, the continuity equation. I substitute all these in, and I equate powers of lambda. So for lambda, for the zeroth power of lambda, I have an equation. For the first power of lambda, I have an equation, and so on. There are no more slides here, because I was afraid I'd get it wrong if I did it in the presentation. But if you do that, you will get piezo without reference to the size of delta t. I was doing this because I wanted to combine piezo itself with non-orthogonal corrections. I thought we could, if we had a theory here, we would then be able to take the non-orthogonal corrections to have a size for the non-orthogonality and to produce some kind of extended series expansion. And I failed completely, which is why it has never seen the light of day, because everybody already knows what piezo looks like, and there's no particular need to derive it beyond the uh, beyond the basics that we already know. But now, with piezo being combined with simple, it may be possible to say, is, is this of any use? So this is an offering to the community to be taken or rejected as appropriate, um, to say, is this going to help you in identifying uh, convergence behavior of your composite algorithms. I will note that we have a power, power series expansion in H, which is capital H over capital A. So the diagonal dominance of the matrix that constitutes those will have an effect on this. It is possible that upwind being more diagonally dominant will make this easier to converge. And I've never seen piezo analyzed against the uh, 
upwind discretization of the convection. So here are a lot of possibilities. I've never explored them. I have gone on to do other things in the oil industry and now back to solid state, which is where I started. But as an offering to the open foam community, uh, who are the successors of everything that I've described today, I hope you will find it useful. And I think that will be the end. I was very, very unhappy that as my memory disappears with the years, I did not feel I was able to write all the names of everybody who needed to go on the thanks for the speed team, the imperial team, and later friends in foam and open foam. But my thanks are at the bottom, and I thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm really sorry I haven't had time for any questions, so I'll just slip off. So, thank you. Any questions? I told you. This one works better. Yeah, okay. There's a passage in the Christian Bible that says when the foundation has been laid, you don't have to lay it again. So I can see that you happily laid a foundation. I wonder if you have a perspective. What is the new foundation for the next building you see young CFD people can do to have a similar experience and then have, you know, 20 years down the road, a community benefiting from their efforts? In the Christian Bible, there are many prophets, and, and you're asking me to um, uh, emulate them. Um, and there are a number of things that I have come across uh, that aren't within the paradigm I laid down. Um, and I don't know how to do that, but they are all part of the same thing. So. This is a low Mac number approximation. What happens if you put Riemann solvers into this? Are they completely different? Do they require a completely different structure, et cetera, et cetera? I have worked in the oil industry. The oil industry does not deal in pressure velocity coupling. There are no velocities. All the flow is immediately next to the wall in the pore in the sandstone. And what you actually have is a coupling between the pressure field and the oil and the gas whose uh, phase, phase splitting is um, determined by the current flow conditions. But velocity is entirely determined by the local pressure gradient and there is no further need for a uh, velocity equation. But nevertheless, the critical thing here is the coupling. It is a complete coupled um, pressure and other variables field. So it's done as a block solution with respect to GM res. Is there anything we can do here? Herb was kind enough to provide me with Tessa's thesis, which then looks at the pressure velocity coupling here in terms of a complete solution uh, and says, should we be looking at it as a block solver rather than segregated solver? How does that come together? How does it affect the underlying architecture? And one of the peculiarities I have come across in the last few years in the oil industry, of, um, you mentioned in your first talk today that people were doing um, two-phase flow and porous media. Okay, uh, very much like to talk to them afterwards. Um, I worked with some people from the uh, Moscow lab of Schlumberger. They were doing 
two-phase flow in porous media. I had attempted two-phase flow in porous media using open flow. I had uh, failed and I went to Henry and Henry told me why I'd failed, which is that everybody knows that at the, the um, spatial scales involved, you get massive spurious velocities. And this seems to be true both of uh, volume of fluid um, and a couple of other options whose names currently escape me. The Moscow lab had done something that they called density functional theory, which appeared to have nothing to do with the solid state density functional theory. But they had an additional um, free energy equation to go with the normal mass and uh, momentum flow. And they were getting solutions. They were getting very slow solutions because they were insistent that they could only do it explicitly. But nevertheless, they were getting stable solutions using this method. And I would like to know why. So there are out there some interesting possibilities for alternative ways of modeling multiphase flow uh, that would be um, worth considering. So all of those are possibilities. And I'll stop there rather than burbling on and see if anybody else has anything to say. At the back. And at the back to your right and then to your left. Yeah, hi, Chris. Yeah, you remember me anyway. No, I know I don't have a question. No, I just want to thank okay, you for thanks, this. Bernard. <laughs> <laughs> but no, don't run away. I haven't finished yet. <laughs> no, thank you very much for the nice talk and the uh, look back in time. To the beginnings, uh, I joined Imperial College in 1990, so last century, man, already. No, thank you very much for the nice talk and uncovering memories that I it, uh, that I didn't even know that they still exist. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I would just like to know your views on you know the, there's a lot of attraction nowadays to move to techniques like machine learning away from solving PDEs directly like we do. Uh, so what's your opinion about that? They're very interesting techniques. I would like to find out what they do, but I am wondering, basically you're saying, I feed you a lot of data and I tell you what the answer is. I don't tell you why. I don't necessarily give you a sense of having control over the knowledge I've just been given. Um, and so reverse engineering machine learning, AI, and finding, okay, that was a solution. Now, how did we get to it? Can we actually extract some kind of um, physical understanding or algorithmic understanding? That seems to be the missing bit. And it may be that um, all our answers come out of that in future, and we don't need to carry on coding CFD, but I'd like to know some answers. On your left, left. Two on. Uh, out of historical curiosity, what kind of computers did you run the speed code on? And was it parallelized? I'm sorry, you used you used the word beginning with P there, and I'm not really certain I know what that means. Um, no, there was no parallelization in those days. Um, so we had roughly the size of actually about half this podium, uh, an Apollo workstation, not quite Unix. Um, I dread to think how powerful it was or how unpowerful it was, but the initial work was done on that. We ported a lot of stuff to Vaxes that we had available. And it was always complained by our sponsors that it all worked on a Vax and fell over on everything else. Um, which was annoying because we didn't actually develop on the backs, we developed on the Apollos. And then we moved on to straightforward silicon graphics, um, Linux workstations, other Linux workstations. Um, uh, but yeah, that was that was the thing. We didn't really deal with mainframes or su supercomputers. Um, my, my enjoyment of supercomputers happened much later when I found myself at the Cray Laboratories um, uh, attempting to debug a code that had had its uh, its source encrypted so we could send it out. So I was on the phone going, 
Yeah, line 34, it says V0001 equals V007 plus and so on and so forth. What does it actually mean? And then they tell me. <laughs> so yes, that, that was the state of art at the time. Very much for this very nice talk. It's all right. You're getting into the dark underbelly of the historical record here. On the far side, please. Oh, hi. So um, you said the speed code was initially developed for, as I understand, in-cylinder motion for the automotive industry. And yeah. if I heard you and her right that uh, you worked at CD at Apco, did any of this end up in Star CD? You know, kind of giving open Star forms? CD was developed independently. Um, my understanding is, which is another way of saying, please don't take this as gospel, is that um, it was my success in getting this going that inspired Gosman to start his own company. But he did it with his developers and uh, it is an independent, it's an independent product. I don't know where it is at the moment and I don't know who the guiding spirit is, but if I said the words Ismet Demirjic, um, who does a very different coding philosophy, philosophy from open foam, or even the sort of halfway house that I was advocating um, very successfully. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised, but I don't know where they are now. Well, no time for, sorry, no time for more questions. <laughs> thank you for that, Chris. I actually tried to invite Ismet, but he says that his Google Scholar citation uh, count is not ticking fast enough for him to consider himself active anymore. Uh, this is not going to go away without some abuse. So please allow me to do this publicly. I spoke to Eugene de Villiers uh, yesterday over dinner. Uh, Eugene, where are you? There you are. And he said, and I quote, oh, speed, that was a terrible code. Can you imagine this guy actually declared all his variables before using them? So I will leave it there. And um, thank you very much for this experience. And we can both kill Eugene uh, together afterwards. I, I, will, I, will, I will warn you that the only time at Imperial that I completely lost my temper was then when a gentleman who shall be nameless came into my office and said, Chris, your code is a total load of old crap. Uh, but I now have some distance, and I'm sure you have your reasons for what you said. And of course, we have open phone now, so we—it's not necessary. So I spent two weeks, and eventually I found that one variable had been declared twice in different places, in, and that was my only—I didn't. Um, yeah, yeah well, so I have very limited experience of all the, you know, the, the, the okay. niceties it, of the, the I am always the very grateful for the open foam community for being so supportive and welcoming when I see them immediately before telling me of the latest bug of mine that they discovered <laughs> and fortunately got rid of after all this time. It's obvious that's never going to change any time in the future. All software is bugs. Are we done?